the horses, Lord God, and we love you and we we love our relationship with you. We we know that you're with us and we expect, Lord, you to be working in us and on us and through us, Lord God. And we know for that to be the most effective, we need to know the word of God. So help us today sharp, to sharpen, to, to, to focus, Lord God, that our minds would be sharp to receive the truths that you want to feed us with today, that we'd be strong, Lord God. We thank you. In Christ's name, amen and amen. Amen. All right. Well, um, some of you even, let me see. I know Bob got water baptized here and uh, Denise's daughter did. And what a tremendous testimony. And it just was a great weekend. Uh, just love it. So anyway, let me get started here in verse one. I'm going to take a piece verses one and two of this book we're in chapter seven of hebrews so if you want to open there let me read you verses one and two and then we'll talk about it for this melchizedek the last chapter just ended talking about melchizedek for this melchizedek king of salem priest of the most high god who met abraham as he was returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him, to whom also Abraham apportioned a tenth part of all the spoils, was first of all, by the translation of his name, King of Righteousness, and then also King of Salem, which is King of Peace. So for this story, we have to go back to Genesis 14. And in the brief, it tells us of a, an alliance of kings that were warring against another alliance of kings. And it came down to a battle where Sodom and Gomorrah was on the losing side. And Abraham's nephew, Lot, was living in Sodom and Gomorrah. And he was taken prisoner in battle. And so he was taken away by the winning side. The news got to Abraham that his nephew had been taken. And so Abraham gathered his fighting men, the Bible says 318 of them, trained for battle, and Abraham pursued, he fought, and he won his nephew back. And after that battle, the Bible says in Genesis 14, verse 16, and I'll, I'll read a little bit here out of Genesis 14, and he brought back all the goods, Abraham, he brought back all the goods and also brought back his relative Lot with his possessions, and also the women and the people. Verse 18, and Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. Now he was a priest of God most high, and he blessed him and said, blessed be Abram of God most high, possessor of heaven and earth, and blessed be God most high, who has delivered your enemies into your hand, and he gave him a tithe of all. So that's the story in Genesis 14. We also read in Psalm 110, verse 4, we've, we've read that about Melchizedek. That's the other verse in the Old Testament about Melchizedek. But let me read Psalm 110 uh, in, its, in its fuller version so we get get what's going on here um, because we we need to know that this psalm is clearly talking about Jesus so psalm 110 says a psalm of david and then it, it starts out the lord which is in the hebrew yahweh the lord says to my lord that lord is adonai so yahweh says to Adonai, sit at my right hand until I make thine enemies a footstool for thy feet. The Lord, Yahweh, will stretch forth thy strong scepter from Zion, saying, rule in the midst of your enemies. The Lord, Yahweh, has sworn and will not change his mind. Thou art a priest forever 
according to the order of Melchizedek. The Lord, Adonai, is at my right hand. He will shatter kings in the day of his wrath. He will judge among the nation. So this is God the Father speaking of Jesus. Um, Thou art a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. It's clear in the psalm that this is God talking about Jesus. So all we basically know about Melchizedek uh, in the Old Testament is the passages I just read in Genesis 14 and Psalm 110. The rest that we know about Melchizedek is in Hebrews, the book that we're reading. So after the battle, Abraham would be hungry, just like any one of us. And Melchizedek brings out to him bread and wine, simple hospitality. But many, many people see in this Christ, Melchizedek, Christ sharing the Passover, representing himself in the elements. The, the name Melchizedek, the word Melchizedek, it's just a proper noun. And the meaning is that it's the Hebrew king of righteousness. The word Salem, the, the text says he's king of Salem, name of a city, it's most probably Jerusalem. Um, and it's interpreted peace. So we have this king of righteousness, that's his name, Melchizedek, ruling as king over the city of peace. So the king of righteousness is ruling over the city of peace, Jerusalem, bringing bread and wine to this friend of God by faith, Abraham, after Abraham was fighting to gain back his nephew, and then Abraham pays tithes to this king. It's not hard to see Jesus, the king of righteousness, ruling over the city of the people, the holy city, sharing bread and wine, his body and blood with uh, his people, Abraham, who come into relationship with God by faith, and they pay their tithes. So it's 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 really obvious there. And then it gets better, verse 3, without father, without mother, without genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like the Son of God, he abides a priest perpetually. So here we have this description, and creative thinkers have come up with all kinds of explanations, but it wouldn't be hard for us to see Melchizedek as a pre-incarnate form of Jesus Christ, because the typology is so clear here. The only record we have of Melchizedek, this Genesis account, nothing is said of his birth, his parents, his lineage, or his death. He appears um, as king and priest, and then he disappears. So it's not hard to think of this Melchizedek as a pre-incarnate form of Christ. Verse 10, now observe how great this man was to whom Abraham, the patriarch, gave a tenth of his choicest spoils. And those indeed of the sons of Levi who received the priest's office have commandment in the law to collect the tenth of the people that is from their brethren, although these are descended from Abraham. So he's he's talking about two different things. Now, verse 4, Abraham brings the tithes to Melchizedek. Now, verse 5, he jumps to where the people of God bring the tithes to the priesthood, the Levitic priesthood uh, under the law. Verse 6, but the one whose genealogy is not traced from them collected a tithe from Abraham, that's that's Melchizedek, and blessed the one who had the promises. So he's, verse 6 is same, Melchizedek, the one who didn't have a genealogy, Abraham brought the tithe to, and he blessed Abraham, the one who had the promises. But without any dispute, the lesser is blessed by the greater. So he's saying Melchizedek, blessed Abraham, so Melchizedek is the greater. 
verse 8, and in this case, mortal men receive tithes. Now, that's the, uh, that's the Levitical priesthood. But in that case, one receives them, of whom it is witnessed that he lives on. That's Melchizedek. And so he's comparing Melchizedek, this sort of eternal priesthood, to the, the, the priesthood under the law. Um, and so to speak, through Abraham, even Levi, who receives tithes, paid tithes, for he was still in the loins of his father when Melchizedek met him. Okay, it may be too early in the morning to catch all that, but it's really a, a, really fun. Abraham's a great man. He's a friend of God. Um, among his neighbors, his neighbors said in Genesis 23, 6, hear us, my Lord, you are a mighty prince among us. So Abraham was great. Abraham was rich. A, his neighbor, he was great among his neighbors. But Melchizedek, here it says, is greater. And it shows that Melchizedek is greater than Abraham because, first of all, Abraham brought the tithes to the greater, to Melchizedek. And also, Melchizedek, the greater, blessed Abraham, the lesser. For those two readers, the tithe and the blessing, Melchizedek is greater than Abraham. So the tithe is brought from the people to the priests for the work of God and to support the priests you know, under the law. The, the Levitical priests or the Aaronic priests, you know, the human priests there, these priests would come later. They came out of Abraham's descendants, out of Abraham's loins. So they were, this passage is saying, in Abraham at the time. Melchizedek's priesthood is superior of a higher status than the Levitical priesthood that descended from Abraham's offspring. So Christ's priesthood is higher than the Levitical priesthood, the priesthood that came out of Abraham, that were descendants of Abraham. The priesthood of Christ is more like is Melchizedek's order. As great as Abraham was, as God's friend, receiving the promise of God to be a nation of God's people, Abraham recognized Melchizedek as greater than he was by giving the tithe and receiving the blessing. So there's no record anywhere that Melchizedek died. You know, in the scriptures, it often says when someone is born and when someone's died, who they were born to and uh, that kind of thing. We only know him as a living man. Uh, like. An interesting perspective sort of is presented to us um, here as the priesthood of Abraham's descendants actually are the ones who paid the tithe <laughs> because they were part of Abraham in his seed when Abraham paid the tithe to Melchizedek. It, it's just connecting that um, uh, because it's true, but it's used here mostly as an illustration. So in the beginning of this passage, in the scripture we're reading says, so to speak, or one might almost say. So it's kind of an illustration of them being in Abraham's loins and paying the tithe. Okay, verses 11 to 14. Now, if perfection was through the Levitical priesthood, for on the basis of it, the people received the law, what further need was there for another priest to arise according to the order of Melchizedek and not be designated according to the order of Aaron? The Aaronic priesthood is the Levitical priesthood. Okay, let's just put that together. Verse 12, for when the priesthood is changed of necessity, there takes place a change of law also. For the one concerning whom these things are spoken belongs to another tribe from which no one has officiated at the altar. What he's saying here is Jesus came. Oh, let me read 14. For it is evident that our Lord Jesus was descended from Judah, a tribe with reference to which Moses spoke nothing concerning the priests. 
Judah had nothing to do with the priesthood, but that's the, the tribe Jesus came from. So if God had planned that the priesthood of Aaron was the ultimate priesthood, one that would accomplish what God had planned for a priesthood, that the one that would be the mediate, mediator, the mediatorial function between God and all people, the, the, the passage is saying, why would the Messiah of David, lin, David's lineage be hailed as, in verse 4, the Lord has sworn and will not change, this is in Psalm 120, the Lord has sworn and will not change his mind, thou art a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. Why would God say that if the Levitical priesthood was perfect and everything that God wanted? It wasn't. Um, God did not didn't plan on the priesthood under the law to usher in the age of perfection, where all the people would be able to access the Father unimpeded, would have direct access to God. That wasn't God's plan. God had further plans to move beyond the Levitical priesthood and into a totally different order, very different, superior, perfect, completely competent to usher in a new age, which the old order under the Levitical priesthood could never do. So the author of Hebrews asks this question to help us understand. In verse 11, I'm reading it again. Now, if perfection was through the Levitical priesthood, for on the basis of it, the people received the law, what further need was there for another priest? It's asking a question to arise according to the order of Melchizedek and not be designated according to the order of, of Aaron? And the answer is because the priesthood, the Levitical priesthood, was not perfect. It wasn't the complete plan that God had. There was more than the law. So perfection, uh, we've studied it before, but it's a, it's a fulfillment of a promise. It's, a, it's an accomplishment. It's completion. So the Jewish people... Now, sitting, reading this, and the Jewish people in the Old Testament, the Jewish people in the New Testament even, they wouldn't really be looking for another priesthood beyond the Levitical priesthood. There was the law. That's all they knew. They grew up in that. That was it. That was God's answer. But so Christians now teaching the gospel to these Jews would be explaining, and, and this is what the author of Hebrews is trying to do, is explain here, there'd be, to these Jewish people, they're kind of hanging on, there's like a lingering orientation in their mind of the Levitical priesthood, and everything that went with it, with it, with which was the law, and that was significant to them, and they kind of held on to that relevance of the law. So the author of Hebrews is making sure that they know that long before the law was ever instituted and the Levitical priesthood was ever instituted, God had declared that there was going to be something greater than the law and that priesthood. And this is back in the, in the passage we read in Genesis 14. We, we just, that was the declaration to tell the Jewish people, no, this isn't it. The law is not it. The Levitical priesthood is not it. There is a higher order of priesthood that's going to supersede it. It's going to totally replace it. And that's going to be the completion. That's what I'm looking for here. So the Levitical priesthood, the Mosaic law, those two things were so intertwined. Replacing the priesthood would also mean replacing the law. So verse 12 in this part, in this passage we're reading says, for when the priesthood is changed of necessity, there takes place a change of law also. We know from Galatians 3.24, it says the law has become a tutor to lead us to Christ that we may be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer under a tutor for you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus, the new priesthood. So now a whole new order has arisen through Christ as our high priest. It's no longer the order of Levi, but the order of Melchizedek, the greater. And it's interesting that the lineage of Jesus was out of the tribe of Judah, 
not the tribe of Levi. That's like awesome to me. <laughs> a whole new tribe, a whole new order. Nothing to do with the old order of the Levitical priesthood. And no member of the tribe of Judah was ever appointed to officiate at the altar. I mean, Judah had nothing to do with the priesthood. And here comes Jesus from the tribe of Judah, a whole nother order, totally separate. So the new order is from another tribe. And it's also the new order is not really exercised on earth. It's an eternal order, and it's not of the material world. So verse 15 says, and this is clearer still, if another priest arises according to the likeness of Melchizedek, verse 16, who has become such not on the basis of a law of, listen now, physical requirements, but according to the power of an indestructible life. I'm just ready to shout hallelujah here. <laughs> The law had all kinds of rituals and all kinds of physical stuff, but now our high priest, our faith is based on an indestructible life, the life of Jesus. For it is witnessed of him, thou art a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. Okay, going back and quoting Psalms. For on the one hand, there is a setting aside of a former commandment because of its weakness and uselessness, talking about the law. For the law made nothing perfect. And on the other hand, there is a bringing in of a better hope through which we draw near to God. So no Old Testament priest was eternal. The Old Testament law and the priesthood were tied to the physical. There was a temple. There were animal sacrifices. There were certain family that the priests came out of. But our New Testament priest is eternal. He's indestructible, it says. And I love that. <laughs> indestructible life. Not tied to the physical, but tied to eternity. Tied to heaven. So people during the Old Testament times, they enjoyed the blessing of God. They enjoyed the peace of God. And they enjoyed the nearness of God. But, but in reality, enjoying th those blessings and peace and nearness of God, actually, even in the Old Testament, had very little to do with the priesthood. And it had very little to do with the rituals. It was the presence of God that they were enjoying. The priesthood and the rituals of the Old Testament actually, actually made people feel more distant from God, if you think about it. I mean, the veil... The, the 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 walls, our better high priest, our better covenant brings to us what the Old Testament couldn't. It enables us to what this verse 19 says, to draw near to God. We don't have to bring a bull. We don't have to walk to the temple. The gospel opens up our relationship with God like the law never could. The gospel and our high priest now are what God has always planned. They are perfect. They are complete. Verses 20 to 22. And inasmuch as it was not without an oath, for they indeed became priests without an oath, but he, Jesus, with an oath, through the one who said to him, the Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. Thou art a priest forever. So much the more also Jesus has become the guarantee of a better covenant. So the Messiah, our perpetual priest, our forever priest, our indestructible priest, he took an oath. We read in chapter six of Hebrews, verse 17, it says, in the same way God desiring even more to show to the heirs of the promise, that's us, the unchangeableness of his purpose interposed with an oath. God gave us an oath. So there's no divine oath mentioned regarding the Old Testament priesthood. In Exodus 28, 1, it says, then bring near to yourself Aaron, your brother, and his sons with him, 
from among the sons of Israel to minister as priests to me. That was it. Bring your family. But but there's no oath. But there is an oath given to us by God with our new high priest. In Psalm 110, 4, as we've read a few times now, the Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. Thou art a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. So the new order, which is eternal, is undergirded by God's oath to us. Verse 22, so much the more also, Jesus has become a guarantee of a better covenant. So Jesus, in the order of Melchizedek, is confirmed in his superiority, as his priesthood is superior, so Jesus is our perfect guarantor, our perfect mediator, our perfect high priest, our, our permanent high priest. So he became our guarantor of a better covenant, and that's going to be discussed a little later in Hebrews. I won't talk about that now. In verse 23, and the former priests, on the one hand, existed in greater numbers because they were prevented by death from continuing. They would die. But he, Jesus, on the other hand, because he abides forever, holds his priesthood permanently. Jesus never dies. He's got it. Hence, also, he is able to save forever those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. What a beautiful, beautiful so no Old Testament priest could continue forever. Every priesthood came to the end. Even Aaron's priesthood came to the end, who was the first high priest, and he served the priest during the wilderness wanderings, but his high priesthood ended. It says in Numbers 20, verse 28, verse 28, and after Moses had stripped Aaron of his garments and put them on his son Eliezer, Aaron died there on the mountaintop. Then Moses and Eliezer came down from the mountain. Okay, Aaron, Aaron's priesthood ended. Now his son Eliezer, now his priesthood began. And he started, and then it went on generation after generation. Eliezer died. And uh, it says in uh, Joshua chapter 24, verse 33, and Eliezer, the son of Aaron, died, and they buried him at Gibeah of Phineas, his son, which was given him in, in the hill country. So Phineas took the place who was Eliezer's son. Now he carried it forward. And there were 83 high priests that officiated from the time the first high priest of the law, Aaron, until the fall of the second temple when there were no more high priests. 83 high priests over that period of um, 1,500 years. So if you divide it out, it's about 15 years average per high priest, plus or minus. I'm just saying it roughly. But that's that's how it went under the law. None of them were permanent. They all passed away. Uh, but now the Son of God comes with the new order of Melchizedek. He becomes the high priest eternally. No one's going to supersede him. He's flawless. He's incorruptible. Jesus completely fulfills God's plan for the high priest over us. Uh, Jesus Christ will never have to hand over his high priesthood to another. We are permanently in the hands of the perfect, great high priest Jesus. Hallelujah. <laughs> so with Jesus as our high priest, salvation is always available. There's no end to his salvation. His saving power is available without end. We are always acceptable because Jesus is our high priest. One of the functions of our, uh, the high priest is to ensure um, God's never failing acceptance of us. But Jesus, his name it goes before us. We have his name. Jesus now, he lives to protect us. He lives to bless us who have committed our lives to him. He understands. He sympathizes. And he really does understand our pain with all he's gone through. And he will always be available for all eternity. Jesus is not uh, the normal mediator who goes between two parties. Jesus actually is God 
And he is a mediator between God and man, but he is God. So he perfectly mediates here. And we could draw near to God with confidence of his help. So uh, I know I'm out of time, but uh, in Romans 8, it talks about him interceding for us. We see him telling Simon, uh, you know, Peter, Satan has demanded permission to sift you like wheat, but I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. And you, when once you've turned again, strengthen your brothers. So, so Jesus forever is praying for us. And so because Jesus was the one who gave himself completely on, be, on our behalf, according to God's will, his prayers are totally acceptable to God. His contact with the Father is unbroken and immediately. And so let me finish here. For it was fitting that we should have such a high priest, holy, innocent, undefiled, separated from sinners and exalted above the heavens, who does not need daily like those high priests to offer up sacrifices for first for his own sins and then for the sins of the people, because this he did once for all when he offered up himself. For the law appoints men as high priests who are weak, but the word of the oath, which came after the law, appoints a son. Made perfect forever. Just love it. Here's the author's final argument for the superiority of Jesus and the new order of the priesthood. The new priesthood is better because the new priest is Jesus. <laughs> I mean, you just got to love it. And of course, Jesus is God. But, but further, he says, Jesus gave himself for us. He suffered for us. And now he prays for us. And when others failed, and those high priests failed at times badly, Jesus never fails. He, Jesus never yields to temptation, though he carried full force the weight of our sins upon him, and he could have turned back. Jesus is perfectly holy. He will never harm us. He will never take advantage. He is all in for us. And although Jesus, this passage tells us, came to walk among, the, among us, he remains separate from, from us in his superior behavior, his sinless perfection. Unlike Aaron and the Old Testament priests, remember Aaron made the golden calf, <laughs> I mean, crazy, who had to... Uh, but not Jesus. Jesus never had to do that. So Jesus is a perfect high priest because he's not tainted by personal sin and selfishness. So he can sympathize with us beautifully. Jesus came to walk as a man completely expecting to die on the cross. So when the hour came, he willingly stretched out his hands, no anger, no bitterness in his heart toward any of us, even toward his executioners. Jesus was not angry with God, but he fully accepted the, that he, he was the sacrifice that he had to be for us. Nothing else could bring us peace with God and, and nothing else could May God accept us into eternal life. Jesus knew this. And Jesus was thinking about you and me when he went to the cross. He died once for all. It doesn't mean it was easy. It doesn't mean that Jesus just pranced up there. No, it was terribly hard. But he did it willingly. And on the cross, at the moment of his death, God fulfilled God fulfilled his oath to us that he made way back and Jesus became our new perpetual high priest after the order of Melchizedek superseding the prior priesthood and the law and this all happened at the moment Jesus the son of God laid down his life as the perfect sacrifice. And now our new high priest, Jesus, 
perfectly prays for us. He perfectly loves us and saves us and strengthens us. And, it, and he's no longer subject to human frailty. But his priesthood is absolutely effective and eternal and perfectly suited to the needs of his people, you and me. All right, Josh. <laughs> I, I don't have, you know, kind of hard to follow that up. I, I just I just think that this communicates that the priesthood of God and the 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 law that the priesthood was supposed to sort of accommodate and perpetuate perpetuate throughout the culture the jewish culture uh is the priesthood was under the law and was helping the jewish people follow the law be under the law themselves and the priesthood was failing and they needed they needed help with the law as well they 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 needed to offer sacrifices but when jesus came along and he became the sacrifice all of a sudden the when when there was a mess up or when there was a failure it was it was not the person that was trusted to be the intermediary between God. It was on us. And we now can know personally the one who's paying the price, the one who's giving the cost. And I, I, I'm, not, I'm not saying anything crazy theological. I'm just saying that, that we know the one who saved us. We know personally the one who who has paid the price for us. And when we step further into sin or rejecting him or giving our lives over to a total mess and throwing it away, what you would think would be the response of someone who's who's torn himself apart for us is that what he, you think he'd say, what are you doing? Why would you do that? Why are you leaving me? Why are you giving up on all I've done for you? Whereas instead, it's like it's like a mom who's who's being hurt by her son and is just ready to to pick up her son and say, "It's okay. I know you're hurting. I know you're messed up. Let's let's try again. Let's try again." And it's totally different than this the old way of doing the priesthood, which was like the sort of a government style thing which is not endearing to think about mm -hmm. but now we have a priesthood someone who talks to god on our behalf that loves us and knows us and we can know and yeah i just wanted to appreciate that is all so grandpa one of the um principles of bible interpretation is something called hermeneutics by that just means one of the principles is we must understand the audience that the author was writing to and kind of understand them. And we have this. We say these are Jewish Christians that are probably being persecuted. Now, it's interesting that the writer of Hebrews didn't do what the Pauline passages usually did. And I, I, Paul could have written this. I don't know. But it almost seems like a different method. You know, Paul always kind of went to the law and to Moses. But this writer goes beyond Moses and goes to Abraham, the father of the faithful. And he builds his own argument on Abraham. Now, Paul did that too, but this is key to him you know, understanding what he's talking about, this new priesthood, and how the old is going to pass away, as, as Scott said, because it's a man. It's not something that's from Melchizedek, something of, from Christ. So it's interesting to me, you know, you hear a lot of people say, well, I don't believe in tithing because that's that's Old Testament. That's the law. No, it's not the law. It's before the law. It's way before the law. It's the principle of God, this generosity. So you all believe that. But I mean, when someone says that, I just like to say, oh, wait a second. You know, the law made requirements. Faith goes way beyond that. 
you give, and what the scripture is saying here, when Abraham gave the spoils to Melchizedek, he gave the top, he gave the best, is exactly what the scripture is saying. That which he, he took from those kings that they defeated, he took the very best he had, which is good, and gave it to, to Melchizedek. Uh, and just, just in the interest of time, let me just touch one more thing, which I like, and it's in verse 22. So much more, also Jesus has become the guarantee of a better covenant. That's an old word, guarantee there. And, and you know that, you know, you, you, you gave something that is a guarantee that you're going to do more. And it, it's a deposit, yeah, that this is going to happen. And I'm committed to it. It's a guarantee. You know, the Holy Spirit is kind of like a guarantee, the paraclete, okay, of a better covenant. Then down at the very end, what does it say? You know, but the word of the oath which came after the law appoints a son. That's the guarantee that God says. This is true. It's 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 something completely different. It's not man-made. You know, man-made stuff with the Levitical priesthood is going to pass away. This is forever. He forever is our high priest. And a high, pri high priest was the mediator between God and man. Now, the interesting thing, this writer is building this case. You know, and in a couple chapters more, we're going to deal with the definition of faith in chapter 11. So he's setting his readers up saying, all this is coming about, you know, Abraham, father of the faithful, and this Melchizedek, a pre-incarnate revelation of Jesus Christ, because there's a new order. The law can't save you. As he says here, the law is not perfect. It can't help you. And for a Jewish person <laughs> to, who actually, you know, with every jot and tittle, remember Jesus, every dot, they follow every little thing of the law. And here the writer saying, no, it's not, you can do everything. It's not going to save you. You've got to have faith in Jesus Christ. And that's, that's his argument. And any Jewish believer, I mean, if they would read this chapter, you know, or this book, it would really set them on end because this is, this is an old order. It was done by God just to show us our weakness that we can't we can't save ourselves like every religion of the world says. You know, you can save yourself if you do click, 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 click. No, you got to surrender. I can do nothing. I trust God's faith. I put my trust in him. And that's the argument that the writer of the Hebrews is building, which is so powerful. And, and Jewish people, if they read this, and, and that's why they have a hard time with this. Can't be. Uh, but it builds upon the father of the faith of their own genealogy, Abraham. I like it. <laughs> it's wonderful. Let me pray. We'll go to the breakout room. Father, um, it's harder and harder for us to trust certain people in this world, our leaders. Even sometimes pastors in a church, sometimes they fail. Um, especially our government, Lord God, various figures. Some are so good and, and trying to live good, but others are so corrupt. Lord, we just celebrate the perfection of our high priest, the holiness of our high priest, the sympathizing, how he cares, how Jesus cares for us, Lord God. Thank you that we could be completely free in trusting Jesus and in being in close relationship, knowing you've got our best interest in mind, Lord God, and you are for us and not against us. Lord, thank you for this wonderful chapter. We ask you to bless it to our hearts and to our lives. In Christ's name, amen and amen. All right, folks, good being together. We're going to head over to the breakout room. And uh, it's nice having been with you. If you can't come, we're going to do a little more discussing over there. But um, if you're watching this later, we're glad you're able to catch it. We love you, too. And so we will see you tomorrow on Tuesday. God bless you. Bless you now.